You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible is Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. Once again, we are delighted to welcome our teacher, Father Paul Tarazi, to the program. Welcome, Father. Thank you very much. Thank you. Father Paul, I'm so interested in today's topic, which is Todmore and Palmyra, because since we've been talking so much about the desert, Ur, Babylonians, and we're talking more and more about this area the city historically, and I know we don't always talk historically, we tend to focus on the literature, but historically we have the city of Todmor, Palmyra, which is an anomaly. It's an oasis, a major city, but it's in this area which is otherwise empty of other cities. And in Roman history, this played a big part because of the way that it sits on the edge of city and desert. And I'd really be interested in hearing more about how this fits into the way that we understand the Bible. Tadmor, for me, as you noticed in my audio in my book, it is actually the center of my argument that the background of the biblical story is the Syrian wilderness. And even, as you recall, in both the audio and the book, I insisted that the scriptural Canaan is the Syrian wilderness. The reason for me, and it attracted my attention very early, Tadmor technically is found only in one place in the Bible, in a very late book, which is two chronicles. It is the last book of the Bible. It is as though the author left us not only a hint, but his own signature. And I would like to go in detail regarding these texts, not so much to speak about Tadmor. I'll say a few words at the beginning, but it's really the text. So I'm going to ask my hearers to make an effort and to take note where it is found and check for themselves. Tadmor, and I'm going to stick with the original name just by looking at a map, is in the center, on its own, in the center of the Syrian wilderness. Obviously, it's a huge oasis, and that's why the Romans later were able to build a city. You need lots of water. And so. But really, by itself, in the middle of the desert, away from Hamat, away from Homs, away from Damascus, away from the Euphrates, and that explains why it was important. It was a major caravan stop, as others also in the Arabian desert. For instance, the name Riyadh in Arabic means gardens, which means it's an oasis there in the desert. And it's important because there is nothing around it. But why the sudden interest in that particular location in the last book of the Bible? And I'm stressing that because... When you compare the Septuagint to the Hebrew, and you know my thesis regarding the Septuagint, that it was a translation made by the authors of the Hebrew, we find a transliteration of the original, Thevmor, just there. Now, the Vulgate transform it into Palmyra, Palmyram, but the Septuagint has transliteration and one more time only there. I stress this only there because in the book of Kings, in 2 Chronicles 8, 4, this is where the passage is. In 1 Kings 9, 10 to 22, we have a parallel text, but we see that there is a hesitation there. We have two traditions in the manuscripts of the Hebrew, Tadmor and Tamar. It is as though the authors or the editors were uneasy. Is it really Tadmor? Now, when one realizes that the Septuagint omits a full passage, which is verses 15 to 25 from 1 Kings, and Tadmor is found in 17 in the Hebrew, then the result is that in the Septuagint, Thevmor is only in 2 Chronicles 8.4. 
So that militates for the uniqueness of the mention of Tadmor in that passage. Now, let me push further and say that in the original, the situation is so difficult that there is a lot of difference in the translation, like when you read the RSV compared to the original in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. So it tells you that the scholars don't know what to do without it, and they have to make their additions. But let me go back to Chronicles, where we have the original and where the major translations try to stick with the original. It says, beginning with 8.3, and Solomon went to Hamat Soba and took it. He built Tadmor in the wilderness and all the store cities which he built in Hamat. He also built Upper Bet Horon and Lower Bet Horon, 45 cities with walls, gates, and bars and Baalath, and all the store cities that Solomon had, and all the cities of his chariots, and the cities of his horsemen, and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and in the land of his dominion. And then we have the mention of the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hephites, and Jebusites. So it's talking about the kingdom of Solomon, and totally out of the blue, besides the names that are found in the area of Judah, we have the mention of Tadmor with the addition in the wilderness, which is kept in the Septuagint, Enti Erimu. So that for me is very striking, because when you go to 1 Kings 9 in the Hebrew, you hear, and Tamar or Tadmor, you have two readings, in the wilderness, and then the addition in the land, which is not in two chronicles. And listen to what the RSV does with it. And Be'alat and Tamar in the wilderness, in the land of Judah. So in the wilderness, in the land, suddenly becomes in the wilderness, in the land of Judah. And that's the downfall of the RSV. It's history sizes and geography sizes. You know, they want that the reader won't be lost. Now, that is precisely an issue. If I hear it the way it is in the original, then what the hearer ends up with is that the same Solomon who built Jerusalem built also Tadmor. But then there comes the strike. Jerusalem fell whereas Tadmor, both historically and scripturally, did not fall, at least in scripture, we don't hear that it fell. And I believe that this is the metaphoric city where God resides, and Tadmor is Tadmor in the original, the way Eden is Eden. There is no Palmyra. So one has to be very careful not to add the word Palmyra. A further reason is that Tadmor in the Semitic languages is from a verb that means destroy. Anyone who knows Arabic knows that. The rubble is damar in Arabic. And Tadmor in the original sounds as the city that destroys. Very often people refer to it in translation of its meaning besides the caravan stop, the bride of the desert, the indomitable, meaning that she repels the attacker. She destroys and is never destroyed. And the stunning thing that this is what happened to that city later under the Romans and until now where it has been destroyed, but it's a very impressive city that survived all the centuries. But that is not an argument to understand scripture. It's enough for us to understand scripture that Tadmor was this mighty oasis. And the author looked at it, as I said earlier, as being the capital, if you like, of his Syrian wilderness that stood there. And it is the background for the Garden of Eden and for the new city and so on and so forth. Remember, I always say that the authors had to have a reference. Scripture is not utopic. It is not speaking about a place that does not exist. Utopia, it's a Greek word. But a Semite has to have a reference when the author is speaking 
about a place. The author projects a certain place and speaks about it as a reference. And according to me, the author was not referring to an oasis in general, but the reference was to the oasis Tadmor in the desert. So I went around to say that ultimately the geographical background of the story is not Judah and Israel and Palestine as scholars made it up as though it is. No, it's the Syrian wilderness, but that's another issue. I talk about it extensively where I show that the mention of Canaan is reflective of the Syrian wilderness. So. Here we have the importance of that city, Tadmor, again, where it is found is 2 Chronicles 8, 4 in a passage speaking about Solomon, the builder. So let me wrap up by saying, why suddenly Tadmor? That's the mystery. You know my approach to the Bible. If you have a phrase or a noun or a small passage, which if taken out does not affect the rest of the story, then it is extremely important, not secondary and you dismiss it. No, to the contrary. It's similar to when Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 speaking about marriage and so on, and then suddenly he says, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, it doesn't matter. What matters is keeping the commandments of God. Why suddenly circumcision appeared in that text? Well, One has to find an answer and not dismiss these things as secondary. So ultimately, even the concordance does not have the last word. What has the last word is the text and the way it is formulated. Tadmor is the place that was in the mind of the authors when they referred to the original garden and the new city Zion and so on and so forth. And one more time, it is impressive because it stayed the same. Like Jerusalem was destroyed, had to be rebuilt and so on and so forth. But Tadmor remains Tadmor the intomitable, an open city with no walls that no one can attack. I mean, it's like the new Zion in Isaiah. But I'm asking again my hearers to go back to the text. Why do you think the name of the city appears in the Hebrew of kings, but not in the Septuagint? That's a longer story. You know, let me go to the extreme before answering this. A special case is the book of Jeremiah that is really quite different in size and content between the Hebrew and the Septuagint. That would be a longer story. (laughs) So I can give you my opinion that, you know, the Septuagint that was aimed ultimately at the Greeks, which is my thesis, and it was in the mind of the authors when they wrote in Hebrew already. They wanted to write to the Greeks, which means against the Greeks, the followers of Alexander of Macedon. But you remember my theory, they wanted to bring them to their knees by reminding them that they have to go back to the Hebrew. Some of them had to learn Hebrew. And we have this reflected in the story of Origen and Jerome. It's very important. Now, given all that, I am saying that the Septuagint reflects the fact that there is something wrong with the rendition of one kings, which is also reflected in the tradition of the Hebrew manuscripts, where people try to correct. They say, Tadmor, it's an impossibility. It has to be Tamar, a city in Judah. So what I'm trying to say, without answering directly your question, but I'm still answering it indirectly. In other words, I'm drawing your attention to the real question, which is Tadmor is strange in that text alongside a number of cities that are found in Judah. But the original is there and the Septuagint is there, which are, if you like, the two originals that draw our attention to take seriously this fact especially that after Tadmor, in the Hebrew, I'm talking about two chronicles, but also one kings, if you take the Hebrew and the Vulgate, you have Tadmor in the wilderness. In Greek, 
19, says more anti erimu In the Vulgate, you have et palmiram in deserto. That is the striking feature. So specifically, the author is telling you that I mean what I'm saying. It is Tadmor which is in the wilderness. Actually, to go back to the Vulgate in 1 Kings, where we have Tamar in the wilderness in the land, and here, as I said, RSV say in the land of Judah, which is silly. The Vulgate has Baalat et Palmiram in terra solitudinis. It combined in the wilderness, in the land, in the Hebrew, into the land of solitude, wilderness. So this is what I really want your question to be rephrased. In other words, we are interested to understand what the author is stressing. The stress is that I know what I'm talking about. And Tadmor is Tadmor. It is not Tamar or any other city in Judah. It is in the wilderness. And this is unmissable. You know my theory about Midbar, that it is from the same root as Dabar, the word. And thus, you know, it was very important, according to me, that in Scripture, the authors had the choice to choose any other words. And actually, in Scripture, you have many words for desert. Okay. But they stuck with Midbar, which does exist. I'm not saying it's not. It's from a root that means to manage. You know, you manage through the teachings, through the word. But it's also the place where the word of God came. Actually, Midbar can be heard as from the word, from the management. And that comes from the desert and not from major cities built by the hand of man. So I hope that what I said sounds as an answer. It's not an answer the way people, especially in the West, would like it. But I asked my question, answer it. Well, it doesn't work like this in literature. You have to hear what the literature is saying, not the answer to your supposed question. When you were talking, you made a point in passing that the Bible is not utopic. You've spoken on this podcast in the past about how the novelty of Scripture is that it deals with what is right in front of the hearer and uses that as its reference. So you're in the desert and Scripture is talking and you're looking around you and you see Scripture, so to speak. Could you just expand on this point? Just unpack what you mean when you say Scripture is not utopic. What I mean, and I said it in passing, is that in Scripture... The authors had an actual reference in their mind to speak about a special place. I'm not saying that Tadmor, if you go and visit it, is the special place that the authors are talking about. No, if they are talking about a garden where God put Adam, you have to hear it as a garden. Actually, the mention of Tadmor, let's say you die before having reached two chronicles in the middle of one chronicles. (laughs) This does not mean that the message of the Bible is not clear because Eden is mentioned and the garden is mentioned. And so I am saying this Tadmor that appears right at the end. And technically, if you take it out and you put Tamar in instead, you won't miss it. So Tadmor is in that place as the signature. You know how the painters in the Middle Ages used to paint themselves in a corner or they were something like that to indicate to you that's the signature. It corroborates my entire thesis that The kingdom we're talking about of David and Solomon, and they collapsed. Notice the original. It says the following. And Solomon went to Hamat Soba and took it, and he built Tedmer in the wilderness. When you hear Hamat, you're talking about that city, which is northwest of Tadmor, on the Orontes. So the author is taking you out of this so-called wilderness of Judah that people go and dig and spend billions there instead of giving the money to the poor just to say that Elijah was there and then you build a shrine. And who did that? It's the Byzantines who built all those shrines. 
It's for business. I'm saying that the text remains the text, and it is read like in our services. The text is read without pictures of archaeology. I hope this will not change. As I told you earlier, even if you take Tatmor out, the Syrian wilderness is there. Now, let me go back to something I glossed over. How come the Hebrew in one king's goes between Tamar and Tadmor? My answer is that Tamar as a location is mentioned three times in Ezekiel 47, which is the chapter with 48, where we hear about the description of an open land without cities and where the only city is the Lord is there at the end of 48. This, to me, one more time, cannot be happenstance. I mean, in serious literature, there is no happenstance. So this vacillation between Tamar and Tadmor in the Hebrew text of 1 Kings may be reflective of that fact that we're talking about that specific Tamar, which is one of the cities of the open land. Otherwise, as you know, Tamar is the name of a woman, which is the date and thus uh, the city of Palms, Palmyra. I mean, we can go into that, but all these are scholarly curiosities, as I say. The point is that the story, and repeatedly I said today, that when I deduced my thesis regarding the Syrian wilderness, that text was not in my horizon. But when I found it, it was, if you like, the signature that I was reading correctly the entire time, the message of Scripture. This non-utopia is very important for me because these people wanted their people to live in that area. They didn't want them to live in their own fictional world. That's very dangerous, which many of us Christians, especially the Orthodox, when they speak about the coming kingdom, they speak about it, that it is somewhere there, you know, but it hasn't come. Where is it? How can you speak about it? and describe it. And then we make up the stories that some of us actually went there and came back and saw it in visions and so on. But this is in the Bible literature. In Daniel and Revelation, this is literature. And cities can play back and forth. You know, the harlot city in Revelation is at the same time Rome and Babylon and Jerusalem. It's a pregnant issue, and I believe the name is there, the indomitable, without walls, it remains, whereas all the cities with walls fall, including Troy. A lot of folks think about language and poetry and literature as a free-for-all. But each time we discuss, I hope everyone is reminded that this is a school of science. It is a discipline. And like every science, every field of science, you have to pay attention to the data. The deity of scripture save the people from the land of slaves to make them his slaves. That, I think, is the Alpha and the Omega. <laughs> the Bible is a trap. Once you start reading Genesis 1-1, you're already entrapped. The only way to get out of it is to throw away the book. But if you want to fight it from the inside and write your introductions and your thesis and your theories to fit with your mind and so on, you're not hearing the text anymore. You are not the slave of that God. You want to say what you want to say. That's a great place to end today's session. Thanks so much. Have a good week, gentlemen. Thank Take you. care. Thank, Thank, you. You, Thank you very much, Father Mark and Richard. Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.